<clears throat> Just clear my throat. Ah, there we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming back again to uh, see me continue on this. So, last time I left you all, um, I was still shaping uh, the overall shape of the Ceratopsian skull. Um, off time that I've had of camera, I've been working on, I don't know if you, how well you're going to be able to see it, but all the different skull structures to make up the skull in a three-dimensional form. So I think it looks all right. Um, still a fair bit to work on, but I'm now going to have to try and duplicate this on the other side. Um, the other thing I need to do with this now is, now that I've raised the horn up slightly, so it actually gives them more of a three-dimensional uh, depth to it, um, what I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to raise the brow a little bit more so it raises this half of the skull and it'll give a more angular look to the eye socket. So rather on flat circle like a human skull, it should hopefully give the illusion of it being more to the side of an angle. So let's start. So hopefully everyone's doing okay. Let's just spin this round. There we go. Um, I've not been doing too bad myself personally. Uh, just been trying to get chores and everything else done in the day. There's nothing more frustrating. In fact, that actually probably could do with coming down a little bit more, actually. Let's see. It's quite warm outside as well, which is always nice. I uh, don't know what the temperatures are myself, but I know I've just been out shopping. And uh, it's a lot hotter than what I was expecting. Okay, so I must swing round like so. And this one's to sweep round there. And then this section of the eye needs to join up round there. So spin round to there. Oh, what's this? Yeah, it's just a stupid pop up. Right, okay. And then. What do we need now? So this needs to be a divide, so that needs to go down there. And then about here should start getting the swinging around there. I also need to groove this section out a little bit. So it gives that part of the uh, cheekbone a bit more definition. I'm assuming it's called the cheekbone, actually. I'm not entirely sure. I've always referred to it as a cheekbone. Yeah, are we? Yeah, yeah, there we go. So that's that part. Now, I've also need to take out just a tiny section for what would effectively be the lower, uh, not the lower, the upper set teeth. Uh, just needs to come just about there. So you don't want to give it a full-on uh, display, but it's just kind of like a hint that it's there. There we go. And just drag that down a bit more. There we go. It's been so much more enjoyable with music. 
Okay, so what am I missing then? So yeah, it was that part of the cheat that I learned to. Okay, so that wants to go down to there actually. So bring that up. And then yeah, there we go. Swing lane to there. There we go. So I don't think I'll refine it on camera. But I'll definitely uh, refine it a bit more later on. Because uh, the other thing I'm starting to notice with this is the warmer it gets in the daytime, the, the stickier this actually becomes to work with. Um, I don't know if everyone else has that same issue, whether it's just me. But, uh, yeah, it's um, it's something I'm not really used to. Some working in the, in the evenings, it's a bit easier. You know, plus... Okay, let's see if we can bring this brow out. Because this is the one thing that's probably been plaguing me the most out of this uh, sculpt. Is that these eyes have just been a nightmare to get right. And as I said before, I think by raising the edges and the brow forward, I'm hoping it should give it a steeper angle. So it gives the illusion that the skull's deeper than what it actually is. Because if I recede the clay anymore, I'm going to be in danger of either making it too thin to uh, support itself when it actually goes on as a magnet and, you know, for, say for argument's sake, it gets dropped. Or... Uh, Or that it basically just hides the sculpt into the stony texture. And then you don't really see the skull at all. Let's see. Yeah, that's not doing too badly. It's probably going to need a fair amount of uh, work either way. So, yes, um, another thing that I wanted to bring up, um, someone asked me in a private message about um, the Buy Me A Coffee um, site that I I'm using now for donations because basically GoFundMe, as um, as good as the site is, unfortunately, it seems to be more aimed at projects. So while I was using it for trying to help me get through university, that was great. But then if I wanted to actually ask people for donations to help support me through these uh, difficult times, um, GoFundMe wasn't going to be the best way to do it. So... Uh, buy me a coffee effectively it's i suppose the best way is a friendlier way of asking people for donations so it's the the principle is it's like the equivalent of meeting up with a friend and they buy you a coffee um as either a thank you or as a you know not seeing you in a long time sort of thing so the idea is it's supposed to be a bit more of a relaxed and um beneficial way of doing it rather than just kind of like outright saying i need donations give me money um but the uh yeah the the site luckily allows you to choose how much you want but of course when you start taking in things things like your um uh site fees and things like that the, the minimum amount you can do is three quid which is much better than go for me because that's about a fiver for a minimum so uh so yeah so if anyone wants to effectively buy me a virtual coffee 
then uh, the link should be in the description below. Uh, but you can also go onto my channel later on and uh, do it that way as well, or even just sharing it, you know, to be honest with you. So I'd rather people share it and make other people aware of it rather than just um, expecting everyone to kind of like fork out money for it, especially in these days where uh, everyone's been laid off due to the coronavirus, which isn't ideal. Uh, how's this looking? Uh, that's looking better. That's looking much better, actually. Yeah, so I think that's what it needed. It just needed a little bit more on that brow to bring it forward a bit. Uh, is this going to be too much? Because there's a fine line with these sort of things. It just has to be the right amount. Let's see. Uh, where's my big ball? Mm, it's not done too badly. All right, okay. So, let's see if we can raise this up a little bit more. So one thing I'm starting to observe with the um, the reference model, or say the reference image, I should say it's not a model, um, for the Triceratops, it's the uh, from the Natural History Museum London. It's the uh, what you call it there um, guidebook. There we go. So the uh, ceratopsid on the front of that is absolutely fantastic. In fact, it's probably one of my favourite fossils, really, out in that museum. I mean, that and the Iguanodon, to be honest with you. Um, as cool as the animatronic T-Rex is, I prefer the uh, the vintage stuff, really. Even if it is technically wrong by uh, today's uh, knowledge but I kind of like that in the sense it actually helps show and display um, how, evol uh, how evolution how uh, paleontology has evolved over the years so it's not just kind of like it's uh, ever changing well it's an ever changing um, thing but it's not like it's uh, you know, it erases the stuff from the past. The past stuff is just as important as the uh, as the present stuff. So, hey James, how are we doing? Let's see. So let me dip in just a little bit. There we go. Yeah, that's definitely starting to look much better now. I just need to blend that lower socket a bit more. So how have you been doing, James? You've been all right? Hopefully keeping your nose clean and staying out of trouble. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. It's always good to have people just stop by and say hi, if anything. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whether that's uh, positive or a negative if it's a quiet stream, but I suppose in some regards, that if that's uh, a benefit for you, then I'm happy. Let's swap that around. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> 
Who is it you're going to stream with later? Is it something for yourself or is it um, uh, watching somebody else? Ooh, what stop motion movie? Tell me, tell me. It might be something that I've seen to give you a somewhat of a heads up on. After all, I am a bit of a uh, stop motion connoisseur. <laughs> apprentice i was an apprentice um or i wish i was an apprentice still um oh, what's it bloody cold now um ambassador there we go for the harry Housman foundation always has its perks oh the black scorpion that's an amazing film you are gonna have such a blast with that yeah but there's um so, some fun trivia actually on that which you might be able to, to pass across for the guys um Obviously, it's a Willis O'Brien project, so that's kind of like a given. But some of those uh, creatures that you see in the uh, in the pits later on, they're unused. Uh, sorry, they were original models that were originally in the spider pit sequence in the original 1933 King Kong. So apart from the scorpions, which were made specifically for the film, um, I believe it might have been. I, I think the worm was part of them. There's a, there's a worm with crab claws that might have been part of the original missing spider pit sequence. But there's a um, it was like a trapdoor spider sequence, and that creature was specifically from uh, King Kong. So it's a little bit of trivia for people that are uh, unaware of the classic history on it. But yeah, it's a fantastic movie. I absolutely love it. I need to watch that again. Um, in fact, I really want to get it on DVD, but it's. Uh, Getting hold of these things sometimes are a bit of a rarity, uh, especially when you've not got a, f a fair bit of cash like I do. <laughs> but yeah, you'll have, you'll have fun with that. It's a really really good film, and it's a bit of an underrated film, I think, as well. Um, considering that uh, it's an O'Brien project, it was just one of those that kind of like slipped under the radar. I mean, in comparison to, say, like, the giant behemoth or Mighty Joe Young or, heck, even, like, um, oh, what was his other project now? Um, Son of Kong. There we go. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really good film. It's definitely worth uh, checking out. And if anyone else is listening that, is uh, intrigued i definitely recommend go watching it it's a marvelous film still black and white so um that can be a bit frustrating for some people and now but uh yeah it, in terms of like it's another good willis o'brien movie Right, okay, so let's just chisel this bit away. In fact, thinking about it, James, if you're still listening, if um, if you guys ever wanted to do like a 
a viewing of a Harryhausen movie in terms of like a commentary, um, I'd be more than happy to uh, come on, spout some trivia. Uh, I always get a kick out of watching those sort of films anyway. And then if I can kind of like pass on any knowledge that Ray told me or anything that I've learned during my uh, studies, during my master's degree, you know, it's uh, it's always good to be able to pass that sort of knowledge on. <laughs> right, okay, so let's spin this round again. How's that looking? Yeah, that's looking much better now. I uh, still need to fix this eye socket. It's a problem working at this angle, you end up working in your own shadow. Uh, where are we? The way around. Yeah, I have to be that way. Always about the subtle details. Right, let's see. Just need to pull this bit back in a bit. Hello, Teddy. No, it's not dinner time yet. Hi, Tyson. How are we doing? Hope you're doing well. Hopefully your uh, weather is uh, doing well for you as well. In fact, Titan, whereabouts are you in terms of... Uh, the world you're in america uk elsewhere <laughs> awesome now i look forward to that james that would uh that would definitely be uh something i'd be interested in i know when i try and get something arranged on uh, the missing compy podcast uh justin's a bit hesitant about it which is understandable because he he wants to re review stuff that effectively that are easy access for people which you know is isn't always everyone's cup of tea but he also has a thing about stop motion effects and original map paintings and things like that and sometimes i, I sometimes I, you know i i respect his viewpoint on these sort of things but at the same time it's like it's all part of cinematic history so regardless of whether it looks realistic or not it kind of like, well, without those effects originally, we wouldn't have the stuff that we have today. So you have to have kind of like a certain amount of respect for it. You know, especially if it's kind of like the stuff that pioneered the uh, the industry that it, we have now today. You know, if, if we didn't have King Kong, we would never have gotten Ray Harryhausen. Without Ray Harryhausen, we wouldn't have got Jurassic Park. And without Jurassic Park, you wouldn't have... All the films that we have today so it's all kind of like, like a knock-on effect really ah you're in the us okay then yeah so you'll definitely have uh, better weather than us then 
And I'm hoping these uh, riots that are going on aren't going to end up making their way down to you. It's uh, an unfortunate situation for many people. And I kind of would have hoped that by this uh, era of human history, we would have gotten past all past this now. But unfortunately, history likes to repeat itself, unfortunately. Okay. Right, I need to smooth this out a bit. Let's see if I can get that shape looking right. So I'm not entirely sure with these horns whether I'm convinced that they look right um i'm trying to give that twist that you get at the top of the horn so it's almost like it's pointing upwards and at the moment they just feel like they're splaying outwards but they don't feel like they've kind of got that um best way i can show it is like so you have there you go yeah um so you have the like the base of the horn down here and then it kind of like curls up and then does that flick at the very top and that's what I'm trying to get here but I don't think I've quite got the right knack for it um, it might just be a case of just putting bits on taking bits off and so forth um, oh Titan 20 mil miles to earth is a fantastic film the one of Ray's absolute best black and white era of film projects If you um, really pay attention to uh, the film story as well, in some aspects, and I don't know whether this was kind of like Ray's intention or not, but it's uh, it's somewhat Ray's homage to uh, to King Kong. And I'm not going to spoil what exactly happens, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a beautiful movie. All right, James, you take care of yourself, mate. I'll uh, see you around at some point. Okay. Yeah, it needs to be a little bit more. Oops. Right. Let's see. I wonder if I wonder if it's because it needs more of a, a bulbous part just down here.
just realized I'm completely closing that out. There we go. Okay, that's not too bad. I don't think it quite simulates the flick quite accurately. Um, um, favorite episode of Primal Titan. Um, ooh, it's a toss between. I think episode three and episode six. I mean, I'll, I really like the first episode as well, but um, I've seen it that many times now. It's, it feels like it got um, a bit repetitive, but I still enjoy the the, the kind of like the um, uh, the story and the plot for that one. But I think when it comes to the emotional side of things, I really like episode three for the mammoths and the um, the well, say I keep saying it's the sixth episode, but I'm not 100 percent sure whether it's in the se- in continuity or not because after episode five without spoiling it for people, I can't see how episode six could just follow on. So I'm not sure whether it was something specifically designed just for um, April Fool's or whether it was an actual in continuity um, film. And I'd love to find out from um, Grendy whether it was... Uh, in the same timeline or not because it was just kind of like made for the sake of being made and to be uh, made out of context then I could kind of follow that and uh, even if it was like made as one of those sort of like side adventures out of the main story I could get that as well Um, but yeah just in terms of like with the events of episode five, it's just like piquing my curiosity of you know, whereabouts it actually sits. Hey, Ethan, how are we doing? Um, how's Wildlife on Mars coming along? Um, it's on hold at the moment um, because of coronavirus. The place I was filming in. Uh, shut down in uh, when was it now? I think it was March, early March. So yeah, unfortunately, I've not been able to do anything on it. I've been able to do a little bit of editing of the three minutes that I've already got, but unfortunately, um, it's more or less all stopped now, which is frustrating to say the least. Um, I mean, it's not like my problems are anything less to anybody else, but personally after working on this for three years and then there's like been 10 years afterwards and the whole build-up for making sure it was ready for Harryhausen's 100th birthday which is on the 29th of June this year um I I can honestly say I'm a little bit gutted that a uh, something as small and insignificant as a virus has had this much of an effect on uh, on the world. But considering it's delayed the Harryhausen exhibition, it's delayed other events that were going to be happening, it's delayed other people that were working on stuff, so it's not like I'm the only one, but it's uh, difficult. It's really difficult. So I'd like to have got a trailer out by now, but every time I I try and start working on it, because I'm working on a laptop as well, so I'm trying to work on Adobe Premiere with a laptop, and it's every time you change something slightly in a clip, you have to render the whole thing out again, which takes about 10 minutes. So that's 10 minutes for every micro 
movement that you alter in the camera angle or the lighting or the color correction it's just really really frustrating and this is why i keep saying to people that are studying animation if you're gonna want to work on your own stuff at home get all of your equipment while you're in university while you've got access to those sort of funds because the moment that you don't have those funds anymore it's really difficult to start yourself up Because it's all about keeping in practice, keeping your skills fresh. At the moment you stop, you quickly fall behind. And I'm really worried about when it comes to going back to hopefully finish off the animation. Because my agreement with the uh, with the building manager was that I would have everything finished for the end of May, so that the space could be given back to um, to the uh, crew that was working there. But I don't know if that's going to fall into, into uh, validation now. Because technically the contracts, the verbal contracts at least anyway, is finished. So I don't know whether I'm going to have it again. It really has. It really has. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you know, it is an important event history because I don't think in anyone's lifetime that we've had this sort of um, pandemic in recent history. I could think of a few occasions that probably fall under that sort of category like the plague and um uh what was it called now um oh i forgot what the name of the illness was um oh yeah i can't remember but anyway yeah um so i can understand that it's uh it's gonna leave its mark but i think the uh the thing that worries me now is that now that we've had this pandemic, how many people are going to take advantage of those who are vulnerable because of this? But there's only way to find that out, and that's to go through it. It's starting to take some shape now. Uh, I can really start to see the logo starting to kind of like fall into place. Uh, just need to just need to get these horns looking right. I think once the horns look right, the rest of it should follow. Because at the moment, I don't know if you're going to be able to tell. Um, Actually, I might be better with this. One. Yeah. So at the moment, this horn is looking thicker than this horn, but then this horn's got more of a ridge compared to this one. So it's trying to get that balance right. Because um, the uh, the design on Sick Triceratops logo, it, with it being stylized, it's a very specific sort of look. It's making sure that I can um, keep it in sync with each other. Uh, Ethan says, will this be a magnet? It will be, yes. Um, so just to give you an idea of scale, this is seven centimetres by seven centimetres. So it's, um, it's it's a little bit bigger than what I normally do, but it's still kind of within that same sort of skies. I mean, where's my toast? There we go. So just to give you an idea of scale, that's the Gaming Beaver toast magnet so it's not much different between the two um because i think when you work to a scale you have to make there you go uh you have to make sure that the um the size is too big otherwise if you end up where's the other one of mine i'm just show you one of the very first versions that i started working on years ago yeah so this is the first the first generation 
uh, design. There we go. And yeah, that's just far too big. It's more medallion than uh, the magnet. So I don't know what I'm quite going to do with these yet. Um, I've got six versions. All to do with uh, fantasy and paganism and spirituality. But um, yeah, it's whether they I can shrink them down to be something a bit more, you know, this sort of thing manageable <laughs> rather than something that's going to be too big. We'll see. Right, so I feel like I need to bulk that out a little bit more. Don't know why. Let's just spread it out here. Oops, there you go. Uh, I know what I'm missing. I know what I'm missing. I need to receive that edge. That's what it was. Yeah, there we go. Because it's a brow horn, I needed to pull it back a little bit. And that aids to the direction that it feels like it's moving forwards um to be honest with you mate uh, ethan i've um i've sort of done the poster um i've got the actual image side of it sorted it's um portrait scale but the problem is though is that i wanted the text to be a certain way uh, sort of like akin to one million years bc uh, or um, or something that was from that sort of like 1950s era but the the person that i had originally asked to do it she started it and she was all kind of like going about with it but then excuse me uh, when coronavirus kind of like kicks in she went really really quiet so i don't know what's happening with it really um i mean if you if you want to give it a shot um set, if you've got me on um twitter um send me a either tag me in a post or um send me a direct message if you can and uh, i'll have a look at the stuff that you've done because at the end of the day, it's like I'd, I'd like I like to give people opportunities. I like to give people the opportunity to um, to prove their skills and their talents, um, which can be sometimes a bit of a, a curse, as much as it is a uh, a blessing in some ways. Because unfortunately, I also have the tendency to have a very specific thing in mind, and if my idea doesn't quite translate to what they envision. Um, Sometimes it, it puts me off, and not necessarily because I think that what they're doing is, is terrible, but yeah, it's it's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, you want a a Picasso, and someone produ produces for you a, a Da Vinci or um, or a Monet. <laughs> it's like mm, that's not quite what I wanted, <laughs> but I do like to give people opportunities to uh, to prove themselves, you know that's pretty much what all my life has been about it's been about people giving me opportunities to prove myself and i feel it's only fair to do the same for others uh ethan says ah, okay well i know a great artist <clears throat> who might be able to do one for you if it's bloody what's his face uh, movie poster guy that did the, does the Jurassic Park stuff. <laughs> I've already asked him. He he wasn't helpful. <laughs> <clears throat> no, he's he's a he's a nice guy and everything, but yeah, I, I don't think he quite knows what to do with 
like a Harryhausen style esque poster. He has a very specific style, and I don't think it quite carries across, unfortunately. I asked him for some advice, and he just kind of went, Oh, I like the font. And that was it. He was like, Hmm, it's not quite the answer I was hoping for. But, you know, it is what it was. And I hold no grudges. Right. Okay. So that's looking much better now. I'm still not happy with those eye sockets, though. Um, quite sure what to do with them uh da, 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 da. i wonder if i widen them out a bit maybe that might help uh, da, 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 da. where's my small tool nope that one. there we go Oh, sorry, I completely missed your message, Titan. Um, oh, yeah, episode three made me feel the most emotional out of all of them so far. Yeah, no, in, in episode three for Primal. Um, I, I really like the way it kind of like caught the emotional personality of, of the mammoths. Um, I, I can tell by what they were doing with those designs that they'd actually been studying elephants' um, behaviours you know really thoroughly it wasn't like it was a uh oh that was it the um it wasn't like they were just thinking oh right okay these are mammoths and they're just going to be these hulking um beasts in the ice age they really kind of thought about actually these things have feelings and emotions and family heritage and outside of humans they're one of the few other animals that can show emotion you know for whether it be for the loss of a a family member or uh, you can see fear in them when they're being uh, tranquilized for tracking um I can only imagine what they feel when uh, one of their own is taken by poachers. Oops, what's going on in the eye socket? I didn't want to do that. Come on. Here we go. Time we on. Uh, okay, so wrapping up in about 20 minutes. Keep it nice and tight to that hour. Get dinner on as well for my wife. I should be coming back from the NHS today. Uh, right, missed a few uh, questions. Uh, so Ethan says uh, he goes by Lensations on Instagram. He does some incredible work. Okay, right. I'll definitely check him out then. In that case, then, um, yeah, I'll um, if you can, because I don't know if oh no, I'll be able to get this afterwards, won't I? Yeah. So I'll I'll come back on those messages later and I'll um, I'll dig him out then. Um, yeah, I really like episode three as well. The music in that episode is incredible. The music in Primal is just phenomenal. I forget the name of the guy who works on it, but um, I remember looking at his um, internet movie database and just being thoroughly like, oh, wow, he did this and he did that, and just being in absolute awe of the guy. And it's things like that that I think make a series worthwhile, um, especially in animation. Um, I know I've said to a lot of people that sound and music is just as important as the animation itself. And Primal is a fantastic example of that, I think. Um, 
you know, regardless of the, we don't have any dialogue and um, that there's no obvious kind of like body language to follow in a sense that, you know, it's, it's pretty much up to viewer interpretation, but it's not to the point where, you know, um, Spear is, is doing a particular hand gesture or a glance at Fang and people being able to say, oh, well, he's obviously thinking this or he's obviously going to be doing that. It's still pretty much like up for debate in terms of like, you know, what is he feeling? What is she feeling? Uh, Tyson says, I think an episode where Spear and Fang travel across the ocean and battle sea monsters and mosasaurs are things that would be really cool. Now, I would really like to see that, not necessarily in an ocean, but in, say, like a... Um, oh, I forget what you what they were called, but you know how you get, like, um, inland seas? So it's like the, it's like a almost like a deep canal that connects up to the ocean, but it's still kind of like a crossway between two continents as they're splitting up. If they had something like that with Spear and Fang and a Mosasaur, I think that would be a really entertaining episode. I mean, we kind of got something similar with the, the River of Snakes, but because it was only like a small percentage of the episode, I don't feel like we really kind of like got and a decent underwater fight sequence out of it. Because when I saw that original uh, snake in the uh, trailer when it first got dropped, I, I just immediately just, oh, that's got to be a Titan bow. They're going to have a, a massive underwater sequence and it's going to be like um, Anaconda almost. And being severely disappointed with it. Um, not that the episode was bad, but in terms of having that particular size snake in there. It's uh, it was a bit deceptive. So yeah, I think having a underwater fight sequence with uh, Spear and Fang you could almost make it like a Jaws homage in some ways. Actually, that they stop off an island halfway over, and uh, then they get surrounded by this mosasaur. Then it's literally just kind of like them trying to evade it as best as they can and fighting for when the uh, opportunity is right. One thing I probably wouldn't want them to do, though, is kill it, because I think when they start being able to kill everything, it almost makes them feel a bit overpowered. It's like there's no threat of that that they could actually lose. So I think by having it as, um, as yeah, like a, an, an evading opportunity um, adds more peril to it. But yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. There definitely needs to be a Mosasaur um, in that series. Let's see. Yeah, it's starting to look much better now. Uh, 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 Ethan says, any word on when season two is coming out? Um, I know it's in the fall for the states. Um, so you're probably going to be expecting that sometime around maybe September, October time, I would imagine. Uh, but for the UK, I'm not entirely sure, because when we originally got it, we got it, I think it was something like January, February of this year, whereas when you guys got it, it was, um, well, I'll say you guys, um, over in the States, it was like October, November time. Um, so I had to watch it via not so legal means, and I'm pretty sure my, my computer's going to get a virus if I keep doing that, especially now that I can't afford the... Uh, software to keep a firewall up but the um but yeah and season two should be out this fall um the lagoon um no so much a lagoon ethan more more like i wanted it to have something that's like it's a body of water that they would have to cross that's not quite a river but it would still be something that's con connected to the ocean so you can get like shallow seas where um 
as the continents were splitting apart, they would literally have like this um, this ocean area that would connect, um, that would divide the two landscapes, but that would still be wide enough for um, for marine reptiles and other terrestrial animals to cross over or cross through, depending on which analogy you want to go with. Ethan says a white mosasaur would be cool. A white mosasaur would be fantastically cool. In fact, I'll tell you there's a cool mosasaur design that I'd like to see, um, not necessarily in, in the primal series, but just in you know in media in anywhere. Uh, there's a graphic novel series called Age of Reptiles by uh, Ricardo Del Agro, I think it is. Um, and one of his stories, I, I remember that much, is in volume one of the um, of the book. And uh, in there, he has a migration. And part of this migration is that these animals are crossing a certain part of the continent. And there's a, a corpse that ends up floating out into the ocean with this, um, I think it's like a baby hadrosaur or baby sauropod on it. And all of a sudden, it just gets surrounded by all these mosasaurs. But the thing I really like about them was that they were colorized like, killer whales like orcas so they had these white spots in a deceptive area where you would expect their eye to be and these white underbellies and they were really lovely designs and it's things like that where i, I like um ricardo's interpretation of colors and such and takes a lot of natural influence and in fact it was his um his mosasaur coloration that actually inspired my xeno tyrannus uh, rex coloration so his uh Orc concept inspired my um, predatory Martian. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I need to speak this down. Where's my paddle? Really not a fan of how this stuff is. It's like trying to get it. If this was monster clay, getting this point on this uh, beak would be so easy. This stuff is like springy and horrible and just blech. Not a fan of it. Really not a fan of it. Although, there is a uh, an alternative version to this um, from the same company that do Monster Clay. I think it's called Cos Clay. So it's exactly like this polymer clay. It's springy and um, soft but you can get different densities I think and you can get some really fine detail in it so at some point I'm going to try and find some how much it's going to be is another question altogether but either way I think it's worth experimenting with Apparently, it's supposed to be really good for um, stop-motion puppets as well, but I don't know in what capacity, whether they're referring to as a sculptural piece or whether they're referring to as a uh, as a replacement for casting, say, so, like silicon and uh, foam latex. It's something I'd have to uh, look into personally. Try and figure it out. How's that looking? It's looking better. Looking better. All right. Okay. So let's expand that bean count a bit more. Oops.
Uh, Ethan says, say someone wanted to start a stop motion passion project like Wildlife on Mars, what advice would you give them uh, when starting? Um, firstly, the scale is massively important. It's one thing to say, I want to do a, uh, a stop motion dinosaur project. But then if you make your puppets too big, you run the risk of uh, making the set too big. If you do them too small, you end up making your um, animation movements too big. So for every, let's see if I can demonstrate with a with a finger. So for every time you move the finger, take a picture, move the finger, take a picture, and, and so forth, the smaller this finger is, the less likely you're able to get control and get those fine movements. What ends up happening is the smaller the puppet goes, even when you move it down a bit like that, it would equate to the equivalent of moving it like that. So the, the, the scale is very important. Um, my puppets um, were roughly about the size of, I'm trying to get an idea of dimension. Um, I, I would I would say this for the Triceratops character, it's probably about maybe three quarters the size of a three paper. Um, but the Xenorex is about, say he's a bit longer than that because his tail's included, uh, is roughly about the same height as A3 paper, um, but the length of him is slightly longer, um, probably maybe about a sheet and a third of paper. Um, I can't remember the actual dimensions with me, and unfortunately both puppets are still back in the studio, so I'm, I can't even whip the tape measure out and just quickly measure them for you um so that would be the the first thing um secondly uh armatures are important um i mean if you want to do it in claymation that's absolutely fine um you don't always need an armature for claymation however depending on whether you go with the stylized say t-rex so something like an admin sort of style of thing, then that's fine because then you can balance the, the body up and everything. But if you're going for something that's more accurate, excuse me, uh, accurate to paleontology, then you'll definitely need an armature in there uh, and rigging as well. Um, they would be the most important things. Um, now, in terms of equipment, you can pretty much do uh, stop motion um with things like webcams um and there's quite a few programs out there that you can use that aren't expensive if not free so that's not an issue uh lighting if you're going to do it professionally you need to get leds but if you're just using anything um as long as it's not something like a halogen bulb so it will flicker um you can get away with that um trying to think anything else anything else uh tie downs versus magnets um tie downs you will always get the puppet to stay upright and that secures your puppet down to the table uh but you will have to drill a hole into your set however if you go with magnets you don't need to do the whole drill side of things but Again, this comes down to the scale of your puppet. Um, it depends on how heavy the puppet is. If it's too heavy, it won't support the puppet and you effectively end up um, constantly having fallen over. Um, but then that's where rigs also come into play as well. Um, so figuring that, that side of it out is uh, makes things easy. Um but yeah, um, but in terms of armatures, um, I would say for someone that's new to the medium, uh, use wire, aluminium wire. Um, it will break over time, but depending on how uh, how much movement you do into it and the way you construct it as well, um, you might be able to get away with it. Um, but if you, I said, I strongly advise people don't do this because it, it can be quite expensive and uh, frustrating if you're not used to it. Uh, ball and socket armatures 
are um, are a sure way of making sure that your puppet will actually be solid throughout the whole production. Um, but they do require a bit of skill in terms of assembly, uh, making sure you understand where the joints need to be and move, and uh, and just yeah, just making it. Uh, in some ways more complicated but at the same time there's a, there's a structural security about it as well but uh, but yeah I would say to people that are starting out just, just use wire aluminium wire or aluminium for those that are in the states um, i trying to think anything else um, uh, stick with latex don't use silicon um Latex, if you've got an allergy to latex, then fair enough. Um, uh, but yes, um, latex is more readily available and cheaper than silicon. Uh, silicon is expensive. Uh, it will break. It's not as robust as what people think it is when it com compared to latex. Uh, so silicon, uh, no, it's latex. No, sorry. Um, and it's trickier to paint as well, whereas uh, latex, you can either pre-paint it or you can um, pigment it. So it's a lot easier to work with. Um, anything else? I'm pretty sure there's tons of bloody bits of information I can think of if I really put my head to it. Um, what else? Uh, lighting, set size. Um, oh, that that's one. If you want to use toys to whether it be for people or just in general the best toy to use is um action men uh, mainly because their clothes uh, they're, they're technically classed as a one-sixth um puppet in terms of their height but their clothes also double up for um, uh, puppet making as well. So if you want to do, say, your own puppet design, but you weren't sure about scale, as long as you stuck to a one six scale puppet, then, yeah, you could just go on eBay and just buy, like, loads of, like, action men um, clothes. Um, but there's, in terms of um, women as well, there's um, a Barbie doll that I used for a stop motion project over in Ireland when I was um, hired by Telegale. Um, I think it was called a yoga Barbie and the joints on that are really, really good. Um, they do absolutely fantastic work for uh, stop motion. And we actually used quite a few of them for the hero puppets. And, uh, and yeah, it was like, and it was just effects with plastic joints. They, they did really, really well. So I definitely recommend that if anyone was going to go for like a, a doll sort of um, um, animation, that's the best one to use. Um, and of course, the, the other thing I suppose is, is important, um, one that's wanting to learn stop motion is um, books. Uh, there's a really good stop motion book out there. Uh, by Susanna Shaw. Um, What's it called again? Uh, Stop motion craft skills for model animation. That is, for me, the holy bible for learning all things stop motion. Um, she also gives things like um, itineraries in the back as well. So if you wanted to try and find specific companies or uh, a particular... Uh, method of doing things it's all in that book and there's about three editions of them i've got the first edition i believe the third one is a bit more up to date so uh, yeah definitely uh, check that out i think you can still get them on amazon i'm not entirely sure but yeah they're, they're good ones to go for as well uh titan says i'm pretty sure i used to think that how stop motion works was that you recorded yourself moving around in uh, moving around an object and somehow it made your hands invisible uh if only it was that easy <laughs> indeed in fact when i was a kid i used to think stop motion was kind of like mary poppins magic and you just snap your fingers and then everything would just move on its own but i used to have arguments with um kids at school i think we had um just recently 
the group of us at least anyway I just recently watched one of um, Ray's films I, I think it was pretty much actually the beast from 20,000 fathoms actually and I knew it wasn't a robot and I knew it wasn't a man in the suit but I hadn't quite understood what stop motion was by then but I knew the aesthetic of it I, I kind of got it was the same thing that was made by um, King Kong and the arguments I would have with people in the playground, like someone would say, oh, yeah, well, that guy that was eaten by the Heredosaurus, yeah, that's that's the operator for the robot. He he was, uh, that was his cameo. It's like, are you just thick or something? It's like, you really think there's a giant mechanical clockwork robot of a dinosaur just wandering New York in the 50s? <laughs> it's like, we ain't got robots now. I don't think we've uh, quite gotten to that stage yet. <laughs> oh, I was a passionate kid then. Well, I'm still a passionate kid now, to be honest with you. But still, it's fun to look back and just think the things that you used to say. There's a wire on that. Um, I'll have to. Uh, Ethan says I'll have to check that book out. I've had a project in mind that I really want to get off the ground. Thanks for the advice. No problem at all. And by all means, if you want any other bits of advice and you've got a question in mind or something like that, always feel free to, to hit me up on it. Um, if it's not during a live stream chat or you've um, seen me on Twitter or something like that, yeah, just hit me up. I'd rather give people the advice for them to do whatever they think's right with it than for people to stumble around and, and try and figure something out and then realise that there was a better way of doing it. Because I know a lot of people in the animation industry are, um, are quite giving with their advice, but then there are others that are very guarded as well. So I remember when I was asking Ray before he passed away um, how he did certain effects in his films. And he would either, his only two responses to me were either it's in the book or I don't remember. And I kind of wish that I had more time with him to um, to probe him for questions and just see if anything would actually resurface. Because when he said to me that, you know, I wish I'd met you all those years ago because you are what I would have wanted out of out of an apprentice. It was just like Yeah, it's um it's hard. It's hard. Okay. So much like round a bit. I hope Sticky T ends up liking this. I'd hate to think I've just put all this hard work in from to turn around and say, nah, you know what, mate, don't like it. <laughs> but then this is the uh, the risk when you have a commission. It's like there's only so much guidance they can give you on what they want. And even then, sometimes your idea of how it's going to be done doesn't always translate out very well. So, uh, so we just have to wait and see. Let's see. How long we got? Oh, sugar, I'm overdue. Well, I think that's, um, that's me for the day, I think, guys. So, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope that uh, anything that I've said has been of uh, an enjoyable uh, content for you all. Um, yeah, so I'm going to see how far I get with this off screen. Um, I might uh, do one more part for, uh, for finishing this off, but I'll see how far I get um, today. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a live stream at the weekend. Um, I've got a few bits and pieces to get on with. Um, so I'll just have to see um, what I can do on that front. But if I am going to come on either way, I'll be posting on Twitter. And of course, I'm doing a, um, 
a um, update on YouTube. So you'll see it one way or another. So um, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, as always, I will have to get into the habit of doing this. There we go. Uh, hopefully you can see it properly. Yeah, it should be fine. Uh, yeah, so make sure you follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course on YouTube. So make sure you hit the subscription and the notification bell for next time I'm uploading. Um, I would really appreciate it as well if people can donate to my uh, Buy Me A Coffee so I can get further materials and um, a video at some point in the near future on how to make your own uh, Tyrannodon. But the problem is, is that I need to actually buy some more Milliput. And Milliput for me at the moment is just out of the question um, in terms of costs. Um, I don't have a job. Um, this is my job effectively. And I'm literally starting from the ground up because everything that I had saved from the Gaming Beaver purchases that I had um, a couple of years ago all went on the project. So I'm literally broke at the moment. So, yeah, any donations you can spare, that's fine. Even if you can't spare anything and you're just sharing the, the, the account, that's absolutely perfect. So thank you very much for joining me. Uh, take care, everyone, and I'll see you in the next one. Stay safe.